Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our next to the last lecture for this cruise. Uh, appreciate you all showing up. Today we're going to be talking about Alexander the Great and Hellenism. Um, the men often tell me, oh, I'm really looking forward to the Alexander the Great one, but hopefully this will be for everybody. So uh, hang in there with us. The last lecture this afternoon will be in preparation for our arrival in Piraeus and Athens, and that will be Greece, birthplace of Western civilization, how it is that we in the West look to the ancient Greek culture for so much of what we understand as being principles, democracy, the philosophy on which we base much of our thinking, etc. So we'll talk about that. I'm going to touch on that just a little bit today because there's obviously a crossover between Alexander the Great and the ancient Greek culture. Um, but to many people's surprise, Alexander was not Greek. He was Macedonian. I actually had a Greek man on a trip that we took, um, the Footsteps of Fate, the first Windstar cruise that I spoke on. I talked about Alexander the Great and mentioned that he was not actually Greek. Well, apparently one of our guests talked to a Greek man at one of the places we stopped, and he was furious at me for suggesting that Alexander the Great wasn't Greek. We'll talk about that. Um, to start out, we need to go back to about 500 BC, <clears throat> about five centuries before the time of Christ, because that's, that's the break point. And as I mentioned before, I still use BC and AD, before Christ and Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, rather than the, the more academic uh, sources, they'll use BCE as before Common Era and then CE as Common Era. But a lot of people don't know that. And they do know B.C. and A.D., so I don't want to confuse people, so I still use that. So we're going back to about 500 B.C. In that time, Persia, as you might remember from six months ago when I talked about empires, uh, Persia was ruling most of not only the Middle East, but all the way over into uh, the Asian countries, down into Egypt. It was controlling all of Asia Minor, or almost all. In fact, they were the world power. They controlled all of what we know of as Turkey, that would be this area over here. Uh, it's bigger than that. Except for the area on the, uh, on the coast of Asia Minor, which were called the Ionian, let's say, uh, called the Ionian coast, and the, uh, the cities of Ionia. What had happened is, back about 1200 BC, there was the Battle of Troy, which was thought for many, many years to have been just a legend that was created by Homer, you know, the, the, and I'll talk about that a little bit in terms of timing this afternoon, that Troy is this city that was assaulted by the forces from Greece, and they defeated Troy with the Trojan horse and all that. Well, we don't know about the horse in that legend, but they actually found Troy. Troy was up here. They have found the ruins of Troy. They now know that there was historical fact of that. Well, when the Greeks came over, and particularly there were people from Sparta, they were from My, uh, Mycenae, and others involved in the assault on Troy. When they won the Trojan War, they ended up getting control of all of this coastline. And so these were Greek cities along there. Unfortunately for the Persians, the cities on the Ionian coast felt so much more Greek than Persian, they were always rebelling against Persian rule. Technically, they were part of the Persian Empire. <laughs> Well, finally, the Persians got tired of that, and in 498 BC, the Ionian cities rebelled again, and the Persians came in with their army and uh, suppressed that rebellion, particularly the Battle of Ephesus. If you all have been to Ephesus, that was one of the Ionian cities on the coast, and they suppressed the rebellion in Ephesus, but they recognized that the problem was that the Greek city-states, especially Athens right here, they were the ones that were encouraging the Greek Ionian cities to rebel against Persia. And so Darius I, the king of Persia at that time, decided we need to deal with this problem at the uh, root source. So they, the most powerful military in the world at that time, the Persian military, they crossed over the Aegean Sea and were preparing to attack Athens. They started out at Marathon. And there's this huge battle between the forces of Persia and the various arm, armies of the Greek city-states. Now, Greece was not one country at that point. It was all individual city-states. Athens was its own nation. Sparta was its own nation. Thebes and Corinth were their own nations, their own city-states. They were independent. They often fought each other over things, and they would get together once every four years to compete with one another to show how much stronger and faster and whatever they were than the other city-states. That's the source of the Olympic Games. That's when they all got together. But otherwise, 
At the Battle of Marathon, they had military units from the various city-states there to fight the Persians. And to everyone's surprise, especially the, the Greek armies, they defeated the Persian army at the Battle of Marathon. And as I mentioned before, it's 26 miles from Marathon, the plains of Marathon, to Athens. Well, one of the messengers at Marathon ran 26 miles to Athens to deliver the news that they had won the batter, battle, and he got there and he said, we are victorious, and then he fell over dead. And like I say, if I ran 26 miles, I'd fall over dead, about mile marker four, I think. But that's, that is how we got the modern race, the marathon, and that's why it's 26 miles, because that's the distance from the plains of Marathon where they had the battle down there. Well. The Persians were driven off, they went back across the Aegean, but they were not done yet. Uh, later on, the King Darius' successor Xerxes invaded Greece again in 480 BC. And they decided not only were gonna, they going to send troops across by boat, but they came over the top, and they crossed up here, uh, the, the Bosphorus, came down and they very famously got down here and as they were trying to invade, there's a narrow pass right here between the sea and the land called uh, Thermopylae. How many of you saw the movie 300? Rippling abs, you know, Gerard Butler. Well, that's obviously a fictionalized version of it, but in fact, a group of 300 Spartan warriors, and the Spartans were the greatest of the land warriors in the whole Greek uh, area. They, supported by some Thebans and others, um, they held the this enormous Persian army off for a period of time until they finally were betrayed and they snuck around behind them and defeated them. But in the, while they were doing that at Thermopylae, Athens, uh, they everybody left the city. You know, they evacuated the city of Athens. The Persian army comes down. They burn the city of Athens. They destroy the city. But, and, but all the Athenians were out by that time, so there was not a, a, a lot of bloodshed. Well, after they burned the city, the Greeks didn't know quite what to do, so they, they loaded back up on the boats, and it started a sea war. Now, Athens was a great sea power. You know, they're right on the coast. And this is the Bay of Salamis. The great sea battle of Salamis, the Greeks once again defeated the Persians, this time the Persian navy. And once they defeated them, they went back home. All of that period of time, called the Persian Wars, between 497 and 479 B.C., that was the focus of the first history that was ever written as we understand history in terms of fairly objective chronological telling of the facts without a bias in favor of one or the other herodotus who's considered the father of history wrote the story of the persian wars and in doing so invented modern history later on um, we get thucydides came not too long after that writing about the next big war but that after the Persian War, which ended 479, we enter into what's called the Golden Age of Greece. To a great extent, I mean, this is just another map which shows you this is Athens, the Bay of Salamis, uh, Thermopylae is right here, some of the major cities, uh, Corinth, Sparta, Thebes. Um, this is the Ionian coast along here that I was just talking about. The Golden Age of Greece was a time when, because the city of Athens had been destroyed, it came under the leadership of a man named Pericles. This is Pericles in the funny hat. Pericles rebuilt Athens, and in doing so, in celebration for the fact that they had won this great victory, he also built the temples on the Acropolis. This is the time when all those spectacular temples that you see on the Acropolis, the Parthenon and the others, were built. Um, in particular, after they had won this battle against the Persians, the Athenians led a, uh, a group of other city-states to join together economically in what was called the Delian League. The Delian League was the major cities and, and uh, some of the islands around Greece got together, they pooled all their finances in order to provide for you know, self-protection in the future in case they needed to arm themselves again. Well, Pericles, since Athens was the most powerful city-state, Pericles took it upon himself to just borrow the money that the other Delian League members had put in in order to build all of this stuff. This is the golden age because not only is it when they built all these extraordinary temples, but this is when Socrates was a philosopher, the arts and literature, uh, if you know the name Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, this is the time when all of these great philosophers, um, uh, playwrights, poets were, were coming along. And of course, as I just said, Herodotus is writing the histories during this time. and. 
Athens grew in popular in, in strength rather they grew in strength over all the other Greek city-states and this was the the blossoming of the Greek culture now the golden age of Greece only lasted 40 years because what happened is and, and these are some images obviously that's the Acropolis and the Parthenon on it uh, close-up image this is the time of the great arts and sculptures this is uh, Socrates Socrates later, after you know, after being so popular for a while, he was accused of uh, destroying the youth, of, of corrupting the youth, and willingly, he apparently didn't fight it. He could have gotten away from it, uh, they say, if he tried, but he drank poison, which was the way people were executed back then. So Athens, borrowing all this money from supposedly their partners and spending it all on themselves, did not bode well with some of the other cities. That led to the next great war, which was called the Peloponnesian War, which was a battle primarily between Athens and Sparta. Athens was the great sea power. Sparta was the great uh, land army. The Spartans were, were uh, extraordinary soldiers. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more this afternoon. But it ended up the Peloponnesian Wars, which sort of were they fought in two sections. The Spartan army kept trying to get to Athens, but Pericles had built a wall all the way around the city of Athens, all the way down to the port of, Pe of uh, Piraeus. Have you all been to Athens before? Have you landed at Piraeus? It's like 26 miles. And they built a fortified wall all the way around all of that. The, uh, the Spartans couldn't get in. The Athenians could get to their ships. And so the Athenians were winning any sea battles. The Spartans, if they'd had a chance, would have won the land battle, and eventually did. They, they said it was like a war between an elephant and a whale. Um, you know, the Spartans on land and the Athenians at sea. Well, that brings us down to the 300s. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that this afternoon when we talk about Greece and the history of Greece. That brings us to the 300s, and the person which I believe is the most underrated uh, historical and political figure in the whole world. And that is a man named Philip II of Macedonia. This is him. That's not him. This is him. <laughs> Philip II came from Macedonia, which was a separate country north of what we know of as Greece. Macedonia was not, when, when Philip took over, uh, as a young man, he became king, it was a, a country of shepherd, uh, she sheep herders and warlords. They didn't have any cities. There was no culture, which is one reason why the, the closest thing they could come to culture was what they adopted from the Greeks, the Greek mythology. Macedonians had their own language. There are a number of languages in this part of the world, the ancient times, Macedonian, Illyrian, etc., Carthaginian, that um, they were not written languages. We don't have any written examples of Macedonia, we, uh, Macedonian language. We just have bits and pieces. But they also spoke Greek because of the Greek influence. Now, the Philip II comes along. He is a brilliant strategist, uh, a diplomat, a soldier, a tactician. He did several things. One, he decided he was going to make Macedonia into a great center of power. And that he was going to build a great city. They had no cities before Philip. And so, first thing he did was he stole a silver mine from the Athenians. A silver mine that was up in the north of Macedonia. And then he had the money. And he built the city of Pella as the capital of Macedonia. He brought in Greek artists and architects and philosophers to build not only the city, but the culture. He brought in teachers and created a school, a free school, and very smart guy. He invited all of the warlords that were still sort of fighting each other in Macedonia, but also in Illyria and um, uh, various other places around them, uh, countries around them, send your sons to our free school. We have the best teachers, the best philosophers, and they all did. Well, what happened was Philip, had a generation of the next the next generation of leaders of all of these areas developed a loyalty to him and to Macedonia, even though they were from other countries. And in doing so, he guaranteed that they were going to be kind of the center of power. Well, uh, the, the person on the right is uh, one of his early wives. This is Olympia of uh, Epirus. Epirus was another city around that time. So he's built the city. He's brought in these philosophers. Um, and he also completely changed the military strategy. Uh, one of the things that he did was he was the first person in history that we know of to create different military divisions. He had a division of skirmishers, he had light cavalry, heavy cavalry, um, 
foot soldiers, another thing that he did was typically in those days they would, they would fight with spears. Well, he expanded that whole strategy by, by inventing what's called a sarissa, which instead of being a six foot spear, is a spear that's between 12 and 16 feet long. He modified the Greek standard of the phalanx as a fighting unit, and they look like this. Can you imagine facing that? All right. Obviously, they had an advantage because they could inflict damage on their opponents long before they could get, get to them. They had mounted cavalry, both light and heavy, and there is some belief, and a lot of people disagree with this, but some people have proposed that Philip may have invented the stirrup. If you can imagine the difference it would make if you were riding on horseback trying to fight a battle, not having stirrups versus having stirrups. Um, it was a huge difference, and so he created this extraordinary military power, and his intention was first to establish himself in this region, and he conquered every country around him, including Greece. This hash marked area over here is, um, is where his wife came from. Uh, this is Epirus. After conquering all of this area, and he continued to have to fight battles and whatnot, his real goal in creating this military was that he wanted to conquer Persia. Now, he came from a land of, of shepherds. There had not been any cities. There was no significant military advantage, but he built this up to the point where he believed he could fight the Persians and conquer them, or at least take part of their land away. I don't think Philip ever believed he would regularly conquer all of Persia. But he developed all of this um, big emphasis on good generals, on creative tactical, military tactics, an extraordinary guy. Well, in 356, he has a son whom he names Alexander. He has a son by his wife, Olympias, names him Alexander. Alexander is a big man. He is handsome, intelligent, charismatic. It's said that he was loved by both men and women. And these are, these are images, and most of them look like this. We believe that's probably a fairly good representation of what he looked like. But in addition to being charismatic and energetic and intelligent, he also was quite ambitious and quite ruthless. But in preparing him for life, um, his father, Philip, in, imported a teacher, a mentor, a guide for him, and that teacher was Aristotle, the Aristotle. And so his, for his early life, he was tutored by Aristotle in the sciences, in philosophy, he was trained in military tactics. At the age of 12, he gained some note because his father had uh, purchased some war horses, and one of them was considered untamable. Well, in watching him, the 12-year-old Alexander could tell that this horse was skittish and nobody could ride him because he was afraid of his own shadow. So Alexander said, I want to try. And Philip said, okay, try. He got on the horse and he directed him away from the sun, or I'm sorry, toward the sun so he couldn't see his own shadow, and he rode him far enough that the horse became comfortable, and then he rode it back, and he was fine. That became Philip's, or I'm sorry, Alexander's horse. He named him Bucephalus, and he rode that horse through most of his campaigns from that point on. Um, Bucephalus died in Asia, um, and he named a city after him, uh, Buce Bucephalus. So he loved that horse. That was at age 12. At age 13, he gets Aristotle as his tutor. At age 16, Philip leaves um, Macedonia to deal with some problems out in one of the provinces, and he leaves his 16-year-old son, Alexander, as the regent in charge of the country while he's gone. Well, as soon as Philip leaves, one of the tribes, the Mede tribe, uh, rebels and threatens to invade Macedonia, where the 16-year-old Alexander is in charge. Well, Alexander gets the army, marches out, defeats the Mede army, and in the process, he renames their capital city Alexandropolis. He's 16. <laughs> Later on, in major battles that were fought in conquering Greece, um, again, as a very young man at 18, he is in charge of the cavalry for Philip's army and is, is extraordinarily successful at that. And so all of this is going on until 336 when uh, Philip is assassinated by one of his servants. There was some idea that Alexander, who had been feuding with his father, and Olympias, Alexander's mother may have been involved in the, in the assassination because Philip had, had sort of moved Olympias out of the way so he could marry a younger woman, right? Newer model. Married a younger woman whose name was Cleopatra, who, had, who they then had a son, 
And so there was real concern on Olympias and Alexander's part that Cleopatra and her son would be the focus of attention and that Cleopatra's son would be the heir instead of Alexander. So there's some idea, we don't know, that they may have been involved in helping that assassination. The guy that assassinated Philip was immediately killed by all of Alexander's friends before, you know, they could get any information from him or anything else. Well, at that point, Alexander takes over. He's very popular with the military, you know, the army, which was the force that decided things. So at age 20, Alexander becomes king and the head of the military forces. He immediately plans to fulfill his father's dream of attacking Persia. And so he first thing he has to do is whenever there was a king change in those times, whenever a new king came on, everybody rebelled. They thought, this is our time to get free. Well, Alexander marches out and he defeats the Thebans. He, he suppresses any of the problems around there. And in fact, when they defeated Thebes, one of the major cities, they killed 7,000 people and sold 30,000 Thebans into slavery as an example of what happens if you try to rebel. And Alexander was ruthless. There's no question about that. So in 334, two years after he becomes king, these are pictures of them crossing the Granicus River. Uh, this is from a mosaic. Uh, this, this actually is a mosaic from Pompeii. This is what it looks like. It has some damage, but it's been reconstructed. And I'll show you that image again later. Uh, again later. This is uh, Alexander here against Darius, the king of the Persians. We'll talk about that. Alexander crosses over the Bosphorus into Asia Minor. And as he is approaching, he had a flair for the dramatic. As he's approaching in a boat, the shore, he takes his spear in full sight of all the other Persian, uh, the other Macedonian soldiers, and he throws his spear and sticks it in the soil, and he said, by this Macedonian spear, we will conquer Persia. And everybody, Aah! you know, they were all very enthusiastic about this, and they thought about it for a minute. This was crazy. So they cross over, and the first place they come to is a place called Granicus. This is the, one of the four truly remarkable battles. I mean, he fought, Alexander the Great uh, conquered most of the known world and he never lost a battle. Given the fact that he was always outnumbered, sometimes as much as five to one, and not fighting on his own territory, it is extraordinary. They still study the tactics of Alexander at West Point and other military academies. So they cross over and various the satraps, which were like local governors, they had gotten together and thought they would oppose him, and so Granicus is the first place they come to. He is outnumbered at Granicus. He has about 35,000 soldiers. They have over 70,000 soldiers on the Persian side. Now, a lot of Greeks, remember, the Macedonians had defeated Greece. A lot of Greeks were fighting on the Persian side because they didn't like the Macedonians having conquered them. So the Battle of Granicus happens, and Alexander does everything you are not supposed to do in several of his battles. For instance, the Battle of Granicus. He was facing his enemy across a river. He's outnumbered two to one. He charges across the river and up a hill at a much larger force. And he wins. He wins completely. There's no question he defeats this army at his first Battle of Granicus. And that's the point at which Alexander began to think that he could not be defeated. His mother, Olympias, had told him that Zeus, the number one god of the Greek pantheon, had visited her at night and had that he, Alexander, was actually the son of Zeus, that he was half god and half human, like Hercules was. That's one of the reasons why you saw the image I, I showed you of uh, Alexander with a helmet like a lion's head, that was what Hercules, one of, his, one of the great feats of Hercules was to defeat this huge lion, and he wore that as his symbol. Well, Alexander took that because he thought, like Hercules, he was half god, half human. Well, when he defeated this army twice his size, again, with strange sort of uh, tactics, he began to really believe that he not only was semi-divine, but that he was undefeated, uh, undefeatable. Alexander has been the subject of so much art down through history. There have been so many different uh, representations of the great battles he fought. Not only that, but he is such a mythical kind of figure that a lot of military figures since then have, have represented themselves as the reincarnation of Alexander. Either literally, in some cases, or at least figuratively. Hannibal, Julius Caesar, Napoleon all saw themselves as the new Alexander the Great. He became the model for the conquering hero 
Uh, this is a painting of the Battle of Granicus. You'll notice the water, you'll notice going uphill, um, and yet they won that battle. At that point, Alexander from Granicus up here, he turns south to the Ionian cities. Remember the Greek, I, the Greek Ionians, just like the Greeks over in Greece, they were not in support of Alexander and the Macedonians. That's remember, he's not actually Greek, no matter what that man in, you know in Greece tried to say. Um, he conquers all of these cities, and he comes up here and he goes to the city of Gordium. Gordium was the site of the famed, the legendary Gordian knot. Have you ever heard of that? There was the, this massive, uh, complicated knot, and the legend at Gordium was that if someone could untangle the Gordian knot, if they could untie it, they would become the conqueror of the whole world. Well, Alexander looks at this legendary knot for a few minutes, takes out his sword, slashes it in half, and then just unravels the pieces. And they went, yep, you're the guy. <laughs> you know? um, nobody else had thought to do that. So he... After Gordium, he turns south through Asia Minor. Now remember, all of this had been controlled by Persia. He comes down to Issus. That's the site of his next great battle. It's in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean between the city of Tarsus, where Paul the Apostle came from, and the cities of Antioch. Now at, at um, Issus, for the first time, Alexander is, is directly facing the Persian king, Darius. Darius, who's called the king of kings, the king of all lands. He's the, one of the great... At this point, the greatest ruler that has ever lived, Darius has 100,000 soldiers. At this point, Alexander has 40,000, so he's outnumbered two and a half to one. Once again, they're facing each other across a river, the Panaris River. This is the Macedonians. These are the Persians, with a lot of Greeks. In fact, you'll, you'll see Orientals, Greeks, Greeks, Orientals, and then Persians. The Persians thought, well, let these other people that are part of our uh, empire fight front lines will be back here. This is Darius, right here. Once again, to everyone's surprise, except for, for Alexander's, he charges across a river at the center of their line. He targets Darius, who's right here. So Alexander charges across at Darius. Darius is so frightened by this direct charge, I mean, they sort of had the attitude, who would dare challenge us? If, again, if you saw that movie 300, they, apparently in the Battle of Thermopylae, this is a real quote, they have record of this, the Persians said, our arrows will blot out the sun. And one of the Spartans said, then we will fight in the shade. <laughs> okay, that's how tough those guys were. Apparently that's a real quote. But the Persians had these massive armies, they were so confident, nobody could ever defy them. And so Darius is there thinking, ah, oh, we'll take that. Well, when, when Philip charges across the river straight at Darius, he cuts and runs. And when Darius, the king of all kings, the king of all lands, when he runs, then the Persian army panics, and they start running. And so this first battle between Darius and Alexander is a clear victory for Alexander because Darius runs away and his army joins him. This is the uh, reconstruction of that uh, famous mosaic from Pompeii. They, they put it all together. This is Alexander, and you'll notice he's going this way, right? This is Darius in his chariot, and you'll notice he's going that way too. <laughs> um, when he runs, everybody runs away. In fact, Darius runs away so fast, he leaves behind all of his baggage train, and they always carried a lot of money with them. He left behind his wife, his daughter, both of whom were captured by Alexander's forces. Alexander treats Darius' wife and daughter with great respect, as he said was due royalty, and he eventually returns them. But after this battle, um, all of Asia Minor, all of what we know of as modern Turkey, had been conquered now by Alexander. Well, Darius sends a message to Alexander, because he gets away. Darius gets away. He sends a message, and he says, Okay, I will give you all of Asia Minor, all of this land you've just conquered. I will give you huge amounts of money, and I promise never to attack any of the lands you control again if you'll just leave. Alexander writes back and says, next time you write to me, you call me king of kings, because I am the ruler of Asia now, not you. Now, most of the Persian Empire still, still was intact. And he basically said, eh, you know, we'll see. The greatest of Alexander's generals was named Parmenius. And the story is that when, that, when Alexander said no to this offer, to give him all of this land, all of this money, and not bother him anymore, Parmenius said, you know, if I were Alexander, I would have taken that deal. And Alexander said, if I were Parmenius, I would have too. 
Get it? I'm Alexander. I don't have to take any deals. And so he continued to believe he was more than human, as his mother had suggested, and that he could not be defeated. He then turns down the coast, the east coast of the Mediterranean, down through what we know of as today Lebanon, uh, down into uh, Palestine or modern Israel. He has some, some pretty good battles in, uh, in, in the areas like Gaza, uh, as, after he gets down Gaza. He gets to Tyre. Tyre is a city, third great battle. Tyre is a city that had never been defeated. Some of the ancient records say that Tyre had walls 150 feet high. That's probably an exaggeration, but Tyre had never been conquered by anybody. And the primary reason it had never been conquered by anybody is there was the old city of Tyre on the coast, but the fortress of Tyre, where the military was, was on an island that was about 800 meters, about, about a half a mile off the coast, and the entire thing was fortified. They had two fortified ports in the north and the south, and Alexander conquers the old city. That was no big deal. Uh, but from a half a mile away, he can hear the horns and the jeering from the Tyrians who are on their, their wall saying, neener, 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 you know, can't get us. And Alexander said, we will see. For the next seven months, he besieged Tyre, and he did something quite unbelievable. He tore down the old city, and using the rubble, the stone and wood and other things, he began to pile it into the sea. He created a, what was called a mole in those days, what we might call a causeway, a hundred feet wide and half a mile long out to the fortress island of Tyre so that he could get out to them. Well, while they're doing all of that, he decided, you know, we probably need a navy because he didn't have a navy with him. Um, he said, so I'll go get one. He proceeded down the coast and all of the, the Persia had a big navy. All of the Persian ships that were at sea Alexander simply conquered all of the ports. And if a ship can't land at some point, they, you know, they have to give up. And so he conquered the Persian Navy by conquering their port towns down along the eastern Mediterranean coast. He took over the Navy, and so he then had a Navy to attack the, the, the island of uh, Tyre on the outside while he was building this causeway. After seven months, he conquered, first time ever, he conquered the city, first time anybody did, conquered the city of Tyre, and because they had uh, tried to deny him, he ended up killing 10,000 of the Tyrians and selling everybody else into slavery. As an example that this is what happens if you try to resist. So he continues down the coast. He gets, interestingly enough, he gets down to, to Jerusalem and the various, uh, the various Jewish leaders in Jerusalem come out to welcome him. And they say, we want to show you something, Alexander. We want to show you in our holy book, the Hebrew Bible. In the book of Daniel, it talks about a fact that a great ruler will come from the west and will conquer Persia. And Alexander says, cool, here I am. I'm, I'm good with that. And he leaves Jerusalem alone. He doesn't bother them. He heads on further south. He gets down into uh, Egypt. They welcome him as a liberator because they hated being under Persian rule. They had been under Persian rule for 200 years. He comes down, they welcome him as a liberator, and because of what the pharaohs had said, they because of what the pharaohs had been, they said, you are divine. And he went, I thought so. You're right. In fact, they said he was the son. You remember when we were in Luxor, that was the temple site for Amun-Ra. Well, we talked some about the syncretism, the fact that various cultures that would combine their gods. Well, one of the things that was happening at that time was they had combined the, the worship of the Greek god Zeus and the god Amun-Ra. So they talked about Zeus Amun. And because Alexander thought he was the son of Zeus, he travels out to the desert. This, this sort of pointy thing out here was a pretty dangerous trip because out there in a place called Siwa, there was an oracle to the god Zeus Amun. He goes out there and the oracle, you know, an oracle t prophesies, tells the future, says, you truly are the son of Zeus Amun and are intended to conquer the world. And Alexander said, do it all the time, right there with you. And so he's declared divine, the ruler of all Egypt, and spends some time there, and then travels back up the coast. And once he gets up here now, Darius, uh, at this point, has run for it and, you know, taken off 
we come to the next great battle, which was the Battle of Gogamela. Now, Darius is still the king of Persia, but he's still got all of this, okay? Yeah, it, it's still Persian. They get to Gogamela on the Tigris River. This is the first time that that Alexander ever hesitated. He didn't, he didn't charge immediately. They get there at night, and they can see all of the campfires of this huge army. In fact, uh, we believe that Darius's army, the Persian army at that point, was at least 250,000. Now, some of the ancient records say a million, but we believe that's an exaggeration. But we do believe he had at least 250,000 soldiers. At this point, Alexander has 45,000. So he's outnumbered five to one. They get there at night, and his generals say, let's attack them now, at night. And Alexander says, no. I want it to be broad daylight when I beat him because I want everybody to see it. I want there to be no doubt who is the ruler of Asia. And so I want him to be able to see us. So they wait till the next day and they're all lined up. And not only did he have five times more soldiers, but Darius had picked the place to fight the battle. And he had picked this wide open arena. Remember, the Persians had been delayed at Thermopylae because it was a very narrow channel. If you've got a narrow place to fight, then a relatively small number of people can hold off a larger body because there's only so many people you can throw into the battle at once, no matter how many you have. Darius was out, was in an open valley where his numbers could help him the most. He also had a secret weapon. Back then, the tanks of the ancient world were chariots. Alexander didn't have any chariots, but Darius did, and Alexander had a secret weapon. Did you see the movie Spartacus? You remember the chariot races in Spartacus, that there was one guy who had swords sticking out from his, his, the wheels of his chariot? Well, Darius had chariots with these swords on the wheels, thinking he would just drive through the, the Macedonian lines and chop them all up. So Darius was very confident. The next day they, they um, sorry, Gagamela there, they line up, and you can get some idea the size of the Persian army here. Darius in the center again. These things are the chariots. This, these are the Macedonians. Well, what happened was, uh, they send, Darius sends his chariots out, and duh, chariot can't turn very fast. So Alexander instructed his troops, when they charge at you, just get out of the way. Let them go by, and then spear them in the back. And it works. So this secret weapon did absolutely no good. Um, once again, Alexander charges directly at Darius, and guess what happens? Once again, Darius runs away. And when Darius runs away, his army, even though it was five times larger than the Macedonians, they all panic and quit too. This is a relief of this battle. You can get some idea what the battles must have been like back then. The people in the funny clothes, these are the Persians. This is Alexander. You know, they wore very military kinds of uh, uniforms. When Darius starts running, he doesn't stop. He keeps going. He no longer is in control of anything. And uh, after this, Alexander continues and he conquers one of the major Persian cities after another. Um, he conquers Babylon, he conquers Susa, which at one time had been the Persian capital. He goes on and conquers Persepolis, which is the capital city. And um, here, and he burns, first he burns the palace and then he burns the whole city. At that point, he officially is in charge of the entire Persian Empire. Darius keeps running, and later on, um, they're interested in fighting him, but Alexander and his troops keep going. They eventually catch up with Darius's coach. He has been murdered by one of his satraps, one of his governors from Bactria. Bactria is over here, uh, getting over toward uh, India. And a guy named Bessus had murdered him for running away and then declared himself the king of kings. Well, later on, Alexander makes a point of finding this guy. He catches up with him, he arrests him, he tries him for murdering the king of Persia, Darius. In fact, Alexander buries Darius with full honors as the king of Persia. Okay, he treated him honorably as an enemy, even though he didn't have a lot of respect for him as, as when they were fighting. They catch Bessus, they try him, they execute him for the murder of Darius, and at that point, there's nothing to stop Alexander from crossing over into areas of Bactria and over into India. He travels over into this area, he wanted, one of the things that Alexander wanted to do was to make all of these lands one empire under him. And so he was very concerned to try to merge the cultures. At this point, Alexander, he'd already irritated his, his friends, his, because all of these, remember I told you they were all in school together? 
Um, these were called his companions, the companions. They were close friends of his, but they were his generals. They were his advisors, but he was in charge. Well, his companions were getting kind of tired of Alexander making a point of how he was divine. They are going, Al, 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 give it a break. Well, he starts with it. So they're frustrated with him over that. Then he starts wearing Persian clothing. And he's doing it because he wants to try to merge the cultures together. He figures that's one way to do it. He then marries a, an Asian wife, Roxanne. And then he insists that all of his generals marry Persian wives. They don't want to do that. They don't want to wear Persian clothes because they think they're sissy. They, you know, they were a rough and tumble bunch. They, they were proud of being Macedonians. They loved their own language, even though they spoke Greek as well. They didn't want to wear other kinds of clothes. They didn't want to marry foreign women. You know, these are rough guys. In fact, every night, that their habit was every night they would get rip-roaring drunk, you know, and then the next day fight a battle. Um, good for them. But they were not happy with, with all Alexander was doing here. Alexander also took 30,000 Persian youths and set up a program to train them in Greek culture, the Greek language, all the great myths, and also to prepare them in Macedonian battle techniques so they could become part of his army eventually. The Macedonian generals didn't like that. They said, we need Macedonians in our army, not Persians. So there was a lot of frustration going on at this time. Um, they continue on to uh, Hydapsus, was his next great battle after visit, you know, going all over Bactria, etc. He gets to Hydapsus. Hydapsus is controlled by a king named Porus. Porus was the strongest of all the Indian kings. Once again, they're across a river from each other. Now, in this case, uh, Porus had something that the Macedonians had never seen. They had never seen an elephant, and they most certainly had never seen a war elephant. So they were a little bit puzzled by that one. But they ended up using the same tactic against the war elephants they did against the chariots. When the war elephants charged them, they got out of their way, and then they, they're stabbing and spearing the elephants in their sides and rear, and so the elephants rampage and panic, and they do more damage to the Indian army than they did to the Macedonians. Well, in this case, instead of charging straight across, it was a horrendous rainfall. It was pouring rain, very slippery um, banks of the river. Well, Alexander has a feint. He has a demonstration, meaning he's faking it out. He travels up and crosses and then approaches the army from the side and ends up winning a great battle again against an army larger than his that had war elephants. The interesting thing about this one was Alexander really respected Porus, and so he let him stay on as king under Alexander's authority, but he let him continue as the ruler there. This is a, an image of what it must have been like for them to fight war elephants, okay? Um, so he's conquered India. Alexander wants to keep going. He wants to go all the way over here to the Pacific Ocean, the Great Sea. And they've been traveling and fighting now for 11 years. And his generals go, Al, 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 we want to go home. This is enough already. Well, along the way, because they were not happy with some of the things that, that uh, for instance, Alexander was accepting the fact that the Persians, the Persians would bow down, face down, you know, uh, prostrate before the kings. Alexander liked that. He told his Macedonian generals, you need to do the same thing. Well, where they came from, you bowing down on your face was an act of worship. And so they were unwilling to do it. They were unwilling to dress like Persians. They didn't like the fact they'd been forced to marry Persian wives. And so some of them start plotting against Alexander. He ends up arresting, torturing, and executing Philotus, who was the head of uh, part of his cavalry, Philotus was, uh, Phi Phi Philotus was the son of Parmenius, his best general. And then to make sure that Parmenius did not take revenge for him having executed his son, he kills Parmenius. And then in a drunken rage, uh, his, his tutor after Alexander, a man that he'd grown up with, was named Black Cletus. Cletus, because they had these big drunken parties at night, Cletus starts criticizing Alexander for thinking he's divine, for thinking they should worship him, for wearing these sissy clothes, for marrying these foreign women, and for having ridiculed his father, Philip II, at one point, because Cletus had been a friend of Philip. Well, Alexander picks up a spear from one of the guards and runs Black Cletus through, one of his closest friends in his whole life. When he sobered up, he was horrendously upset with himself. In fact, he grieved over it, and the stories are that he considered suicide for having killed his friend. 
So things are not going so well with he and his generals. Well, finally, they get here into, uh, after the Battle of, of Hydaspes, all of his generals say, Alexander, we don't want to keep going in that direction. We want to go home. Well, the story is that Alexander couldn't arrest all of his generals, so he went in his tent and pouted for three days, and then he came out and said, okay, we're going to go home. But we're going to do it by going down the river, the Hydaspes River and the Indus Rivers, because I want to see the Arabian Sea. So they went down there, and then they, he said, okay, let's head for home. And they started out, but unfortunately, right here you've got the Hydrosian Desert, which is one of the worst deserts in the world. It was summertime. Thousands of the Macedonians died trying to cross that desert. They finally get across it. They get up here to Persepolis, to Susa, and then to Babylon. Alexander intended for Babylon to be his capital, the capital of his new empire, because it's right in the middle of things. And it was a, had a famous history, the Babylonian city. Um, and there, in 323, Alexander falls ill. We still don't know what he got sick from. Some people have said food poisoning, some said other diseases, but he gets sick. And it's apparent to his generals that he's dying. And they come to Alexander, and he doesn't have any heirs. They say, who is to be your heir? Who is to rule after you? There's a question as to whether he said Craterus, which is one of his generals, or if he said Crateroi. Crateroi means to the strongest. And then he dies. Well, say to a bunch of generals that have just conquered most of the known world that the person who's to rule after Alexander is the strongest was an invitation for war. First, this gives you an idea how much he conquered. All the way up into Eastern Europe, Egypt, all of the Middle East, Asia Minor, all the way over here to Pakistan, India. This is another image of how it fits into the larger world, one of the, the greatest empires ever. Not as large as the Mongol Empire, interestingly. People don't think about Mongols, but they have the largest empire ever but still very, very significant. What happened was, after all of that, when they interpreted, the generals interpreted to the strongest, that led to a war called the War of the Diadochi. Diadochi was the Greek word for successor. His, starting out, there were nine generals that started fighting each other over this. And it ended up, there being, it went from nine to five, and eventually to three. At this point, the five, the, the, Kingdom of Antigonus, Antigonus uh, Monophthalmus. I always get that wrong. Antigonus Monophthalmus, because he had one eye. One of his eyes he'd lost in a battle. So Antigonus took all of uh, the, the Levant and most of Asia Minor. Ptolemy got all of Egypt, and that's why we talk about the Ptolemaic period in Egypt. Cleopatra, the Cleopatra, who committed suicide in, in 30 BC. She was the last of the Ptolemaic line in Egypt, okay? And Seleucus, or Seleucus, took most of what had been India and Asia. We then had Cassander and Lysimachus took over parts of the north, up in Greece and um, what had been Macedonia. Later on, Antigonus gets pushed sort of out of the way. This orange area is up here in Macedonia is all he ended up with. The um, Ptolemaic Empire continued and in fact, in fact expanded, but Seleucus is the one who grew most. And so the, the, Seleucid, the Seleucid Empire, the Seleucids were the one that were controlling Israel during the time that, uh, between the last prophet of the Old Testament and the time of Jesus. They're the ones that the Hasmoneans were fighting against um, because the, the descendants of Seleucus in the Seleucid Empire, they were trying to force the Jews to give up Judaism and worship the Greek gods. That didn't go over very well, and so they had wars over it. Um, this, all of that continued. I mean, they controlled all of this part of the world until the coming of the Romans. Slowly, the Romans kept pushing. They took Macedonia, they crossed over, they began taking parts of um, Asia Minor, and at this point, we've got the Ptolemaic um, empire down here, we've got the Seleucid Empire up here, that's when they were controlling, and this is the Hasmonean state. This is 90 BC, that's when the Hasmoneans were controlling Israel. One of the very few times they had their own rulers was when they drove the Seleucids out and the Hasmoneans were controlling it. Um, this is, later on, the division of the empire in the uh, 4th century. You remember we talked about this, and I'll show you in a second, the division between Eastern Greek and Western Latin, 
uh, empire, the Roman Empire split in two. The western part spoke Latin and was centered in Rome. The eastern part spoke Greek and was centered in Constantinople, or Istanbul as we know it today. Why did all of this area speak Greek? In fact, they spoke Greek over here too, but why did they all speak Greek? Because of Alexander. Everywhere he went, he spread the Greek culture, he spread the Greek language, he spread the worship of the gods, he spread athletics, everything Greek. In fact, in Israel, for example, there was a period of time when so many of the Jewish people were speaking, and this is in the, the 200s, 300s, so many of them were speaking Greek, they forgot how to speak Hebrew. And that's why, in the 200s, they had 70 scholars come down from Jerusalem to Alexandria. Alexander launched, uh, planted 20 cities in his travels, and he named all of them Alexandria. Like George Foreman and his sons. George Foreman has, what is it, six sons, I think it is, and he named them all George. They're all George Foreman. Interesting calling them to dinner, I guess. But Alexander planted all these cities. Well, the city of Alexandria, which he planted but never saw really developed, uh, it had grown to be a major cultural center. So the, they called 70 scholars down to Alexandria from Jerusalem, and they translated the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, into Greek. That's called the Septuagint, because Septuagint refers to 70, and the tradition is there were 70 scholars. They did that because Greek had become so dominant, a lot of the Jewish people no longer read Hebrew. And in order to read their own holy writings, the Tanakh, they needed to have it in Greek. The conflicts that you read about in the New Testament between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees were those people who wanted to resist the Greek influence, or Hellenism. It's called Hellenism because the ancient name, in fact the name today in Greek, for Greece, is Hellas. So when you talk about Hellenized, it means Greekified. Because Hellas was the name of Greece. You'll still see on maps that are in Greek, you'll see Hellas is the name they use. So these Hellenized uh, Jews and other cultures, they had completely accepted the Greek uh, culture. They spoke Greek. The Sadducees represent the Hellenized party in, in the, the time of Jesus. The Pharisees represent the group that was fighting against that Hellenizing influence and wanted to speak Hebrew and wanted to keep the, keep the old traditions. That's why you had a conflict going on. But the division between the Greek East and, you remember, uh, Alexander never went over here. He conquered Greece and the area around that in Eastern Europe. He never got over here, so he didn't have that influence. All of this, however, was Greek speaking. It was, this is Justinian in the uh, 500s AD. Justinian is the emperor of the Eastern or Byzantine Roman Empire. He, he's the one that built the Hagia Sophia. This is outside, this is inside. If you've never been there, shame on you. Go to, go to Istanbul if for no other reason than to visit the Hagia Sophia, although there's a lot of other things to see. This is an example of one of the mosaics that for many, many, many years was painted over in the Hagia Sophia because it had been a Christian church then when the Muslims conquered it, they turned it into a mosque. And then Ataturk, one of the things he did as a gesture to the West, is he turned it into a museum and they uncovered all of the Christian art, or much of the Christian art. So this was all Greek because that's the influence that, was, that he had. This is the Byzantine Empire under, under Justinian. That's this guy. All of it Greek speaking. In fact, they carried the Greek language into areas that have typically been Latin. And then later, when the church split, between the Eastern Church, or Orthodox, the Western Church, or Roman Catholic. The Eastern Church had its center in Constantinople right there, the Western Church in Rome, Patriarch of Constantinople, and the uh, Bishop in Rome. Those were the two church leaders. One of the big differences between the two is they spoke Latin here, they spoke Greek there, primarily because of the influence of Alexander the Great. I mean, there were other influences as well, but that was a primary <laughs> So much of what we understand is, you know, that history and culture, that whole part of the world, is because of this one guy, Al, as his friends call him. Any questions about any of that? You always laugh. It hurts my feelings when you do that. Sorry. Uh, any questions about any of this? Again, it's not just the one guy, but the effect that he had on the history of the world. Yes? What color was his hair? What color was his hair? <laughs> Red. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what color his hair was. He's represented mostly in black and white in terms of marble sculptures and things like that. He, he, in some of the paintings, he has black hair. I'll go, go back here. 
And given where he came from, he probably would have had dark hair. But um, uh, let's keep going here. Am I making you dizzy yet? Mm -hmm. yes. um, that'll work. See there, black hair. Yeah. I don't know. The photographs of him tend to be blurred. Yes. How old was he when he died? Thirty-two. He conquered most of the known world by the time he was 32. It's the old thing about, you know, by the time Alexander the Great was my age, he'd been dead for 26 years. Um, but, yeah, 32 years old, and he conquered most of the known world. Yes? Uh, you said he started out with 45,000 troops. Right. Uh, Actually, 35,000 initially, and then he gained some because he would get uh, people coming on board. Okay. When, when he conquered these far-reaching areas, that he, he must have had to leave people there to keep control, otherwise the empire wouldn't exist. Right. He did. Uh, in fact, a couple of things happened. For instance, after he uh, had conquered Asia Minor and he began to travel south toward Tyre, he, uh, or Tyre, he sent Parmenius with uh, a, a group of his soldiers over to conquer the rest of Syria while he was going down the coast. Uh, he was getting recruits as he went along because uh, people, I mean, people like to join the winning side. You know, nothing succeeds like success. So he did get some people coming over to his side. He was trying to do that, partly because he wanted to recruit. He wanted to turn it into one empire, so he didn't want it just to be Macedonians in his army, and he didn't have enough of them anyway. So uh, he, and he had left an army back in Greece. In fact, there was a rebellion in Greece, and he'd left, he'd left one of his generals back there. And at one point, he was really concerned. He was worried that they were going to lose Greece, and he, he sent money back to help you know, hire more mercenaries if they had to or do whatever they need to do. But then he got word that, that the general he left there had been successful. So he was recruiting people as he went along, both because he wanted to and because he needed to. But the Macedonians were never keen on that. There were times when he did get uh, additional uh, soldiers coming from Macedonia. And so he continued to have that sort of core of his own Macedonian soldiers. But he did recruit other people as well as he went along. Yes? Do you have any feel for the role of slaves in this society? Obviously. He's generating a lot of slaves as he's right. conquering places. Yeah, I mean, he, and that was one of the things, is the people that didn't get killed often got sold into slavery. That was one of the great punishments. I am not, I really don't have a knowledge of how they used slaves, particularly in um, Alexander's empire. I, that's something I, I don't know the answer to. Sorry. I'll always tell you, I don't know. If I can't think of something really quick. <laughs> yes? You talked about Tyre. To what degree is it preserved? And is that part of Israel now? Uh, Tyre is part of Lebanon now. Actually, Tyre was one of the Phoenician cities. If you look at any maps from that time, you know, like the first century when, when uh, well, the 1000 BC when David and Solomon, you know, that period, and 1900 BC, you'll see Israel there, but then there's a string of that they call Phoenicia. Phoenicia was not a country. It actually was simply a region. They needed a convenient name for it, but it was made up, like Greece had been, of city-states. Tyre was its own nation, nationality, if you will. It was a city-state, as was uh, Sidon, was another great city in the Phoenician region. So uh, that area is part of what we today know as Lebanon. Tyre, you know, they, it's on the coast, and they had this island fortress. Tyre was a great seafaring, or the Phoenicians, Tyre and Sidon and others, were great seafaring peoples. Tyre actually had planted a colony in North Africa, which was called Carthage. And so the Punic Wars, which were the wars between Rome and Carthage, Rome was actually fighting against the colony that had been planted by the Tyrians, by, by the city of Tyre. And they became one of the most dangerous enemies. In fact, that's Hannibal, Hannibal the Great, who crossed over through the Iberian Peninsula, crossed the Alps with his war elephants, and was never defeated by the Romans. Hannibal kept chasing the Roman army up and down the... the uh, Italian peninsula trying to bring them to battle and the Romans kept skirting away from him. They wouldn't actually fight him. And finally he had to go home because of problems back in Carthage and later on they defeated, uh, there, you know, there were was it three or four Punic Wars. Uh, three? I think it was three, yeah. Three different wars that they fought against Carthage until they finally completely destroyed them and, you know, insulted the earth quite literally to, to destroy the culture. But that was a Tyrian plant. That was a colony planted by Tyre. Any other questions? Yes. Who are the successors to Alexander in Greece and Macedonia? Well, the generals, first nine and then five, the five, two of them, Lycomachus and Cassander, were 
took over in Greece and Macedonia. And then later on, they were, you know, they were pushed out, and Antigonus, who had been pushed back out of Asia Minor, ended up being the ruler there, and he can, his descendants continued until the Romans came in and took over. Okay? So all of this area was controlled by the generals, and, and that, that varied in terms of they, they were still fighting wars. For, they, they fought wars for 300 years until the Romans really came in. Um, and that, those were the various wars of the Diadochi, of the generals. Thank you all very much. I'll see you this afternoon.